So if we look at this, you know, if we return to kind of hyperelasticity for a second, right? Um, So in, in hyperelasticity, we basically say that the stress is, you know, the tensor gradient of some strain energy density functional with respect to the strain. Right? So IJ. And this strain energy density functional, if you remember, was, you know, we defined it as like rho times the Helmholtz free energy, where the Helmholtz free energy was basically a function of some internal state variables, and I made this heuristic argument that we can choose the internal state variables to be the strains, right? And of course, this derivative wouldn't make sense without that. Right? And to be more precise, we didn't really talk about it, but it was in the original energy equation, uh, Himmel's free energy, but it could also be a function of temperature. And basically what this says is that if you give me the strains and the temperature, I can tell you what the stress is. Okay? So this is sort of the basis of hyperelasticity. You give me the strains and the, and the temperature, and I can tell you what the stress is. And vice versa, right? It's an invertible relationship. So let's consider this sort of plastic case where I have a stress and a strain and I load it up and I unload it. And I tell you that the strain is sigma zero. What's the stress? Is it sigma one or is it sigma two? It's impossible to say. I don't have enough information. So what we need is some, what we need to add to basically this, and it's, not, it's sort of not hyperelasticity anymore, but you know, basically here we're saying that the stress is a function of this, in hyperelasticity we're saying stress is a function of the strains and the temperature. But we need something else, right? And right now, I'm just going to say, hypothetically, some other internal state variable. And these internal state variables are basically history variables. They're, they're in, this, in this setting, they're, well, they, they actually don't have to be. Let, let's speak about them more gen generally. Yeah. Is that a sigma? Yeah, yeah it, it doesn't matter what it is. <laughs> it's just, yeah. It's just something else, okay? All right, so this something else, you know, may be some type of physical variable. And that could include information about the microstructure, or in the case, uh, it could be some kind of physiochemical reaction. Right? So if we have some underlying information or some other underlying equation that tells us how those state variables evolve due to reactive chemistry, uh, so this could be also, say, a phase change of the material. So if we have some type of equation of state that tells us that at you know, some pressure the material turns from solid to a liquid, right? then, then the internal state variable could include that information and, and evolve it. Right? It could be information like uh, densities of defects, of structural defects. 
and this is a sort of a hot uh, area of research in mechanics right now, is so-called micromechanics. So in micromechanics, you assume some uh, flawed densities and develop some mechanics as to how those flawed densities evolve with time, and then use that to feed information up to a higher scale through one of these internal state variables. Right? But more often than not, they're purely phenomenological. What I mean by phenomenological, does, does everybody have an idea what that word means, phenomenological? So it, they're motivated by both, phenomenological means sort of motivated by both physics and observation. In other words, we, we can't, we, we want to develop some rule for how these internal state variables evolve. And we don't have, we, we're not smart enough to do it from a purely physics standpoint. Or, it's not a lot of times that we're smart enough, it's just too difficult to include in very large scale calculations, right? We, we want to simulate a whole reservoir. We can't be worried about how every two pores interact, right, in the porous media. Even if we can physically write down the equations, okay? so. What we do is, you know, we, we understand that there's some microstructural phenomenon that's going on and it influences the global response of the material and we sort of combine that information to develop a, a law or a rule, right? And it's, so, sometimes they, they've, they're not always driven purely by first principles, but in the end, they work well when you use them at this sort of continuum scale or large scale, okay? So in that, in that sense, they're not purely empirical, they're not just curve fits, they have physics in them, but they're not purely physical either. So a lot of times what you'll see are models that have physical terms and, and also have some sort of fitting parameters uh, sort of in addition to them, right? So it's sort of a marriage of, of physics and observation. And, you know, in these phenomenological models, we'll use internal state variables, and by far the most common one is something we call the plastic strain. Okay, and so what the plastic strain is, if we go back to our kind of cartoon tinsel test, the plastic strain is this guy right here. It's, it's that permanent strain after unloading, right? And so we develop models where we use this plastic strain and we let the plastic strain evolve in time according to some rule. That rule is called a flow rule. And we let it evolve in time and this gives us an internal state variable that we can work with to do these type of plasticity modeling. So this is that extra information we need so that we can model this type of behavior. Okay, yeah. Should we subtract the elastic uh, strain from this? No, the, the plastic strain is actually defined as, as uh, just like I have it. Yeah, just like I have it. So, It's defined like this, but you'll see in a minute there, there's obviously some elastic strain. Okay. So, and, and, and that would be this, right? You know, the material was loaded to here, which was a greater strain value. So, so this unloading produced, this was the elastic strain here. Right? And so this sort of, your question leads to, to a sort of universal assumption, and that is that the strain, the total strain, can be decomposed into an elastic part and a plastic part, okay? And technically this assumption, as I have it written, is only valid for small strains you know, that we're dealing with in this class, but uh, a more general 
a more general uh, statement that does hold for large strains as well is that we can, in, and you'll see, you'll, so you'll see me use either one of them when convenient, is that the strain rates can be con decomposed into an elastic part and a plastic part. So, so this holds always. This is only true for small strains. What do I mean by small strains? What's our mechanical definition of small strains? Well, that's, yeah, that's sort of a secondary conclusion of, of being small strain. And that the, the real assumption is that this, sort of the magnitude of the gradients of displacement are much, much less than one. Right. So we've said that before. I'm just, just repeating it. 